Just a couple things on bigger picture before we dive into the passage itself. Um, chapters 8 through 11 are a second cycle of visions. Revelation has cycles that kind of follow some similar patterns. And so now we're in a second cycle. The chapters 4 through 7 and 8 through 11 each kind of follow a pattern. There's an opening scene. There are six judgments, there's an interlude of care for God's people, and then there's a final climactic judgment. And so there's kind of a pattern there. Um, But in these patterns, uh, there's not always uh, consistency from one to the next. So, for example, in chapter 6, 13, it says, "...the stars of the sky fell to the earth." And then in 8.12, which we'll read today, it says the fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars. So in 6.13, all the stars fall and then, and then it says a third of them fall. So we're kind of starting a new cycle. It's almost like, it's almost like um, the last cycle is, um, is, is something separate. Um, and so this is, this is just another um, example of the kind of literature that Revelation is. It's one, of those, it's one of these difficult places where all kinds of biblical literature kind of converge. Um, Revelation is what you would call apocalyptic literature, and that means it conveys heavenly realities with otherworldly symbolism. So a lot of the stuff that goes on in this book is really, is really strange. It has pieces of things that we might be familiar with, but it's very bizarre, and it's difficult to interpret. And a lot of it takes place in heaven, um, a place that we've never been ourselves. And so we don't always understand everything that's going on and how. Um, so it doesn't... It doesn't fit our normal, our normal categories for things. It was written in the East, and in the Eastern way of thinking, they don't think linear, they think holistic. And so there's, there's pictures, there's kind of this hole here, but it's not necessarily sequential all the time. So this is not written with a post-enlightenment scientific perspective that we would have. Um, And I think that a lot of misinterpretations of Revelation are when you take our current mindset of the way that we put things together and we impose that on the text. And that's, I think, where most of the faulty, or at least I would argue faulty, interpretations of Revelation come from. We're taking a post-enlightenment Western worldview and we're bringing that to a text that was not written for that worldview. And so we kind of have to look at Revelation with a little bit different eyes. And so pressing the imagery to produce consistency misses the point. The consistency that we would sometimes look for is not what is on John's agenda here. And it's not what he's trying to convey. And a lot of the commentaries that I'm reading also say this. One of, us, one of them said, um, it's a great mistake to read his fiery, passionate, and poetic spirit as though he were composing a pedantic piece of scientific prose. Or as one of the study Bibles that I looked at said, a little more succinctly. This is a picture book, not a puzzle book. And so a lot of us want to put these pieces together to try to make something linear, but it's not really designed for that. I'm going to call your attention to some of the difficulties as we go along here. Okay, the text. Let's read verses 1 through 5 here. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal... There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, 
And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Okay, let's go through that piece by piece here. Verse, verse 1, it says, The seventh seal, which is kind of part of the last cycle. Some people put verse 1 as part of that last cycle there. They open that, open that last seal and then there's silence in heaven for a half hour. It's almost like everything just stops. There's kind of this, this sense of something coming. The final seal has been broken. And silence, somewhat consistently in the Bible, is, is a prelude to God's judgment. There's a, at least a couple times in the prophets where, where silence is kind of a foreshadowing of God's coming judgment. So Habakkuk 2, verse 20, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And Zechariah 2, 13, Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. So we're supposed to be silent because God is, God is coming. And it also, in uh, the way that stories are told, it kind of builds suspense. Everything just went silent all of a sudden. It's been loud a lot. A lot of shouting and great cries, and now there's silence. So verse 2 says, There are seven trumpets given to the seven angels. Okay, so trumpets back then, particularly shofars, um, they just make those loud noises, and it's, it's, it can mean different things. Um, if you're in battle... It can be a signal to attack, so you do a loud blast so that everybody all over the battlefield knows it's time to attack, and they do. Or another thing that a shofar sound means is an announcement of some kind. And so these seven trumpets are going to announce God's judgments. There's going to be seven of them, and that is going to be the function of these trumpets. They're going to announce What's coming? Uh, and this, this part's a little difficult because it says these seven angels. Almost like we should know what they are. But this is the first time we're introduced to seven angels in Revelation. He's probably talking about some, some Jewish traditions here, at least from what can be understood. Um, there's some early Jewish writings that speak of seven angels and uh, these seven angels even have some seven names and such. One of them is the archangel Michael, Raphael, uh, and a Gabriel, among some other names. So he's probably referring to that, or at least that's the best that we can figure out. And then there's a few verses on prayers here that I think are important for us to pay attention to. So in verse 3, it says that there's another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Okay, so these angels are given their trumpets to announce God's judgment and judgments, but the angels don't blow their trumpets before the prayers are offered. And so... There's, if, if we're taking this picture in here, the angels are given their trumpets. Okay, here it comes. We were silent for a half hour, and now the angels have their trumpets. Here it comes. Oh, no, not quite yet. Not quite yet. There's prayers that need to go up first. So prayer plays an important role in these events here. And that's something that I think should stand out to us. So verse 4 there, it says, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. So if you think of like incense and how when you're burning incense, it kind of fills the air with an aroma. 
the, the picture here is that the, the, there's prayers and there's incense, and the prayers kind of go up, kind of like an aroma of incense, right before the throne of God in heaven. So our prayers are like incense right before God himself. Our prayers are not futile. They don't just kind of go up into the sky somewhere. They go right before the throne of God himself. And like incense, they're kind of like a pleasing aroma, which is language that is normally associated with Old Testament sacrifices. It's, our prayers are a pleasing aroma to the Lord. He, God likes it when we pray. That's a pleasing thing to him. And then there's angels participating too. And so there's almost a little bit of a coordinated worship that we have. We could almost think that when we're praying, we're participating in heavenly worship even. Because this is kind of part of like a ceremony that's going on up there. And then in verse 5 there, it says, Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So these prayers in that censer now get filled with fire from heaven, and then that gets hurled to the earth. So the prayers here are connected with and maybe even enact the coming judgments. So angels are about to blow their trumpets. Nope, not yet. Prayers first. And then... These prayers, these prayers go up. Then this censer that held those prayers now gets hurled to the earth with fire from the altar there. Or the, yeah. So there's a connection here. Let's never underestimate the power of prayer. Prayers unlock and unleash God's power in some incredible ways. And the way that prayer is connected to what is about to happen is meant to give us a picture here. The picture here is that prayers are powerful to shake heaven and earth. That's what it's about to do. So in the case of the people of Revelation in these seven churches, God's people are being persecuted from without. They're tempted by falsehood from within and complacency. And now God is going to respond. So heaven and earth get shaken. On the earth, there's an earthquake. In the sky, there's thunder and lightning. And in heaven, this is where it all comes from. From heaven to the earth. Okay, let's start looking at some of these trumpets now. Verses 6 and 7. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. It's almost, I almost get a picture of like all seven of them are in a row. And they each put the trumpet to their lips, or almost to their lips, and they're, they're ready to blow at any time. So then the first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Green grass is Basically, we should understand that as a third of the vegetation. So not just green grass, but a third of vegetation. Okay. <clears throat> what we have here, hail and fire mixed with blood thrown upon the earth. We're not really told who does the throwing here. So sometimes there's, there's pieces that are almost missing Sometimes I, as I'm reading Revelation, I'm getting the idea that John is seeing these things and he's writing frantically to try to get as much as he can. And once in a while, there's, there's like pieces that, that it's like, it'd be nice to know how this got thrown, but I don't know. That, that's just kind of the way that I read it sometimes. Um, we have this red storm here, fire and blood. Can you imagine hail like fire and blood raining on the earth. It's similar to the seventh plague of Egypt where there's this great hailstorm that falls on the land, like unlike anything before. 
But this is a little bit strange. I mean, we know what hail is, we know what fire is, we know what blood is, but we don't usually put those things together. Hail is frozen, but this hail is on fire. And this hail also is mixed with blood. That's weird. So it's a little strange to read for us, but the images, imagery here is what the Old Testament would refer to as the day of the Lord. So one of the more famous day of the Lord passages is from Joel 2. It says this, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So we have day of the Lord imagery here. Ones that we wouldn't necessarily put together, blood, hail, and fire. But we're evoking day of the Lord imagery. Verses 8 and 9. The second angel blew his trumpet. And something like a great mountain, burning with fire, was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Okay. So in the second trumpet, we have a fiery mountain that afflicts a third of the sea. So, this is a little strange to us too. We don't often see mountains getting uh, hurled into the sea. Um, And if uh, the the, um, commentary that I read that really tries to get a scientific view out of this one, Um, said that this is a meteorite that falls in the Mediterranean Sea where there are many ships and goes to some lengths to try to explain how how many ships are in the Mediterranean Sea, that it could be a third of all the ships. Um, But it's, this is a pressed, uh, this is pressed for, that's beyond what the text says. It's not really consistent in the interpretation So mountain is interpreted non-literally as a meteorite. But what's strange here is that if it is a meteorite, how do a third of the ships sink? If this is a meteorite, then how do the third of the ships sink from that? Assuming that there are a third of the ships of the whole world in just the Mediterranean Sea, even if we assume that. If it's from a massive wave, then it would not just damage ships. It would also damage a lot of coastlines, like that 2004 tsunami would. But it doesn't say anything about that. It just says the ships. And if it's the blood, how does blood sink ships? You'd have to say that, well, it's not really blood then. The imagery, you'd have to, you'd have to nuance it, and you'd have to interpret it not as the plain text. The point here is that God is afflicting different pieces of his creation. Okay? So, in this case, the sea. He's already done the land and the vegetation on the land. Now he's afflicting the sea. So the point here is that there's different pieces of God's creation and he's afflicting different ones. If we try to make an actual event out of this, the imagery doesn't really hold up. At least I would argue that. Verses 10 and 11. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, And many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Okay, so this third trumpet, a great blazing star embitters a third of the rivers. Okay, if you approach that with a scientific reading that this has to depict an actual event to come, um, a scientific reading of this passage actually has no science to corroborate it. This doesn't work. Um, So, 
in my commentary that I'm looking at that tries to get something, something real out of a real event of the future out of this. It says, it, this star must bury itself so deep at just the right spot that it pollutes the water supply of a third of the world's rivers. Evidently, there's a place in the earth where the headwaters of three great rivers come together. That's really reaching. If you look at the map and how many watersheds there are that feed the rivers, there are tons of them. It's not like there's one place where there's three rivers and the star hits one of them. If you're trying to have a scientific reading of that, it doesn't hold. So, again, I would argue that this is imagery. And unless major geological transformations occur, like we go back to the Pangea thing that they talk about, one star will not be able to reach an entire third of rivers. That would be impossible. Unless, and again, unless the whole earth kind of comes together and becomes just a few watersheds or something, as the earth stands right now, that would be impossible for one star to do that. So it says a third of the waters became wormwood and many people died from the water, okay? Um, we'd have to take wormwood non-literally either because wormwood doesn't kill or rarely kills, actually. It makes things very bitter and nasty and it can even affect your body in certain ways, like can affect your nervous system and give you some hallucinations and stuff like that from what I understand, but it very rarely kills you. So in order for, to read the plain text here and just to go with that, wormwood would have to become more poisonous than what it actually is. This is a visionary, this is a visionary reading here, and if we're looking at it as a vision, what it's saying to us is that God is afflicting different pieces of his creation as an act of judgment. So now he's going after our water supply so that a third of the waters are now bitter. Verse 12, the fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light might be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. So this fourth trumpet, the luminaries, the sun, moon, and stars, they lose a third of their light. And it says basically a third of the day and a third of the night are not lit by them anymore. Okay, and again, if you tried to get a scientific reading out of this, the imagery breaks down. You, have to, you cannot read it plainly anymore. You have to try to change some things. It's very difficult to explain how the sun and moon and stars losing a third of their light would also somehow speed the earth's rotation so that we would have shorter days. If you're reading this as a vision, as I think we need to, God is afflicting the light which he created and on which we depend. We depend on the sun for our light and our life quite a bit. And if God sort of takes that away or starts to, even just a third, that's going to really hurt us bad. So again, Similar to the ninth plague on Egypt where it says there was darkness, darkness that could be felt. God is taking away the light and he can do that. And then verse 13, Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. And that's the end of the chapter. So this eagle is crying. And he cries, whoa, three times. In other words, 
it's going to get a lot worse. A lot worse. So in the sequence of seven seals in that last cycle of visions, um, there's a break that occurs between the fourth and the fifth one, and we have that here also. So it's kind of, again, a pause saying it's going to get really bad now. You think that was bad? Now it's going to get real bad. But it also says, if you read carefully here, it says, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. All right, now, that in the book of Revelation is code for something, or it's supposed to signal something to us. And Revelation, the, the people who dwell on the earth always refers to unbelievers, the wicked, the people who don't know God. Every time it's used, that's who it refers to. So, last chapter, or no, verse, chapter 6, verse 10, there's these martyrs under the throne. Maybe you remember that part. And they ask God, how long until God will bring his judgment on those who dwell on the earth? They're definitely not asking for judgment of their brothers and sisters in Christ. They're asking for judgment on those who dwell on the earth. So now we have an eagle saying, woe to those who dwell on the earth. In other words, woe to the unbelievers and the wicked, the people who reject God. There's other verses in Revelation where it refers to uh, the wicked or unbelievers also. So the coming judgments that are the worst ones are just going to affect unbelievers. We'll get to that next time. But just taking in this chapter altogether here, something that, something that really stood out to me or a thought for us tonight is that when God has hidden all these different pieces of his creation and just taking away like a third of each one, God is sovereign over all creation and he is able to humble us at any time. By taking away the things that we depend on, God is able to humble us. And it wouldn't take much for God to do that. And yet, his real wrath is reserved for the wicked. So I'm going to close today with 2 Peter 2 verse 9. It says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. That's what we're seeing here. God knows how to rescue believers from trials, and he knows how to keep the wicked under punishment until the day of judgment. And that's what we're seeing here. Let's bow our heads and let's pray to God together. Lord our God, the, the visions that you gave your servant John are, are pretty impressive visions that really show how you are sovereign. And Lord, we need to pay you reverence because, Lord, you are, you are the one who controls heaven and earth and all things that you have created. Lord, we depend on you constantly for everything. Lord, please continue to provide for us in the future like you have in the past. And Lord, we always want to humble ourselves before you and to recognize that you are our God. We put our trust in you that you will deliver us from trials and that, Lord, your justice will come. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.